Hello YouTubers, Evil Biologist here with my second video on understanding the public debate about evolution. Last time I listed off some evolutionary theories and talked about some basics of the theories of common descent and natural selection. This time I'll discuss genetic drift and how it relates to gene diversity and natural selection. Now before that, I feel that I should explain another concept. See, most of the DNA in your genome is neutral, or nearly so. This is a mathematical certainty. Biologists may not have formed a consensus on the exact amount of junk DNA in humans, but it is impossible for the, this percentage to be anything other than a majority of the DNA present in any of the organisms with a large genome like humans have. This is because it would be impossible for any population to weed out the random negative mutations that would occur every generation if a large percentage of the DNA code actually did something important. As it is, because of all this junk DNA, mutations usually go unnoticed and basically do nothing to the organism. Now that brings me to the evolutionary theory of genetic drift. Last time I explained how natural selection is a non-random way that allele frequencies in a population can change over time, or evolve. Well, genetic drift is what we call random changes in allele frequencies. Drift is always at work on neutral genes, and to varying degrees on non-neutral ones. Genetic drift is stronger in smaller populations. To see why, we'll try this. Get yourself some M&Ms, and let's do an experiment. Feel free to try this experiment at home or in your classroom. Be the life of the party. Impress your friends. All right. For the purpose of this experiment, each color of M&M represents an allele, a version of a gene. Here I have two normal-sized, unopened bags of M&Ms. Let's hypothesize that the Mars Milky Way Company makes an equal number of each color of M&M and does a decent job of mixing their M&Ms up in the process of making these bags. Given that, then we can predict that each bag will contain some of each color of M&M, but more important to my point, we can predict that each bag will have approximately the same proportion of each color. And this proportion should also equal the proportion at the factory. Now, if our hypothesis about the machine that made these is correct, then each bag should have six colors of M&M. Brown, yellow, orange, red, green, and blue. There should be approximately equal numbers of these, so they should all be about one-sixth of the total. Okay, so let's open the bags, pour them out into two separate areas, and count the number of each type of M&M in each bag. Okay. Here's what I got. As you can see, there are 56 total in each of the two bags, um, but the uh, ratio of different colors is going to be different within each bag. Um, to figure out uh, what, the, what that ratio is, then um, all you have to do is take the total, 56, and you divide each of the, the totals of each color um, by 56, which I'll do for you right now. Okay, so right now we've got uh, basically equal numbers in both bags of brown, orange, and blue. Uh, you can take a look at the fractions there. Um, the yellow, red, and green, uh, as you can see, they're slightly different, but uh, I would bet that if we did a chi-squared statistical test on this, we'd find that the two bags are not statistically significantly different from each other. Now let's pretend that a hurricane wipes out most of the population, leaving only six survivors. We'll make sure they're all mixed up, and I'll close my eyes and randomly pick six M&Ms. I'll show you. Okay. 
Okay, so here I've set aside six M&Ms. And as you can see, there is two blue, two orange, a red, and a yellow. Now, um, these are very different fractions than what we had before. What we have here now is um, one-third blue, one-third orange, one-sixth red, and one-sixth yellow, which means we're missing two colors. So we have something very different than the fractions that we had with the original bags of 56. See, this is one of the reasons why it's important not to let populations in nature become too small or fragmented. It weakens the strength of natural selection, and random genetic drift becomes more prevalent. In other words, small populations make evolution more random, while large populations allow non-random selection to work more effectively to weed out the less beneficial mutations while spreading the beneficial mutations. This sort of evolutionary understanding should guide our environmental policies to promote species survival and is one of the major reasons that a decent public understanding of evolution is so important. And that, YouTubers, is why I do much of what I do. Now, before I go, I'll show you what this scenario might look like if the alleles represented by the M&Ms coded for something important and we were therefore under natural selection. So before we considered the genes to be neutral in regards to each other and that it didn't really matter which version you have, um, in this case the M&Ms themselves, the color is going to represent the color of the organism and let's see what happens um, with natural selection, when a predator uh, comes and, and picks off the easiest or, uh, ones to spot. So, what would happen is that over time the predators would end up picking out the ones that were the easiest ones to see. There are ways to demonstrate this um, in a more realistic situation with uh, ground cover. But I think you get the point. And so, you end up with different populations that are better adapted for each of the areas that they live in. And I bet you could guess which ones would be likely to end up in which spots. Uh, just based on the color, it's not random at all. Um, the orange ends up uh, being prevalent in the orange areas, uh, the blue on the blue background and the green on the green background. The other colors that Aren't, don't blend in well with any of the three end up getting wiped out. Well, that's the way selection works. It's not random. Genetic drift is random and it's because of those random forces that we need to, to make sure that populations stay at sustainable sizes. Um, the cheetah is a good example of a population that fell well below 50 in, in number and as a result all the cheetahs now basically have the same, they're basically clones of each other. Mm, selection. Till next time!